session. Um, if you have any questions, there is a chat box that you can, um, we'll do a question now, just so you see where to answer or to put in your question and then I will stop whoever's talking and ask their questions. So, um, I'm just doing a message and then we'll get ready to go. Okay, so um, if anybody else joins in, we'll let them in, but we'll go ahead and get started and we'll start with our executive director, Paul Capiello today. All right, thanks Susan and uh, thanks for all of you for joining us. Uh, we figured since today uh, was the announcement of the Nobel Prize in Physics for Black Hole Research, We'd invite you into the black hole of cool plants, a place you can get lost for a long time, which is which is great fun. Uh, so, um, basically, uh, we we decided the list is so long, we'd have some fun with picking out a few of our specialties. Uh, people always ask this time of year if this is a good time to actually plant things, and what I always say is plants are always happier in the ground than they are in a container sitting on your driveway. So this is definitely the time to be planting. So I'll get off, in, I'll start off with uh, my first pick. We, we each picked five or six plants, um, except Jacob who put together the PowerPoint. I think he got an extra one. But first one, we're gonna start off the season with China Doxa Forbesii Blue Giant. Uh, China Doxa or China Doxa, depending on your, your pronunciation. One of the great minor bulbs, these little bulbs that uh, pop up early in the season. They give you a great burst of color, and then they pretty much just go away for the rest of the summer. Uh, you can plant them under the, the shade of deciduous trees in mixed perennial borders. You can even do them in containers. And these things are just reliable. They live, they multiply, they bloom reliably in early spring. And a great shot of kind of sky blue with white, a white eye in the center. And I don't know if these things have ever failed to work. They just perform year after year. Uh, the deer don't eat them. Uh, I live right off of Bardstown Road in Louisville in the Highlands. We even have deer on Bardstown Road and they've left these alone in my garden. So China Doxa, this uh, particular cultivar, cultivar Blue Giant has a little more intense blue and a little larger bloom uh, for the six or seven or eight individual flowers on each stalk get about eight inches tall. And really, I wouldn't have a garden without the minor bulbs and, and Blue Giant is one of my favorite. So that's uh, China Doxa and I will throw it to Sadie. All right, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is a lot of fun. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of different things and I will apologize ahead of time for my Latin pronunciation. I'm not very good at it, so I'll give it a stab. But the next minor bulb that I'm going to talk about is the Aranthus silicicata, um, or the winter aconite. This is another fantastic spreading early bloomer in the garden. We have a bunch planted out at Udell underneath the beech trees and also in our millstone garden. It's a very cute yellow buttercuperish looking bloom. And the foliage on these is also really cool because it just kind of whirls right underneath the flower. Um, and I think that's really cool. It almost looks like those funny collars that you could see in like Victorian outfits and stuff. Um, so it's a really cool bulb and it spreads a lot. And I've seen it tolerate a variety of conditions. So you can see this picture. I think Jacob took this photo and it's absolutely covering this hillside of this particular garden. And it's just absolutely fantastic. You can see these popping up super early and even through the snow. Um, whenever we do get snow, you can see these popping their little flowers through. And it's just a really fun addition that's going to spread and naturalize throughout your garden. So next, I'll pass it on to Jacob. Jacob, we can't hear you. That's good. That allows me to start over because I wasn't doing so well. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. Glad you could join us today. And I uh, really hope you can join us tomorrow for the members only part of it. And we're going to have about 200 plants available on the website. 
Uh, so outside of the 16 we're going to talk to today, we still have a lot of great plants that's going to be, a, be available. But uh, as you can see by the picture there, I never pass up the opportunity. Uh, seventh grade me loves the plant name like Horus Quamigra, and I'm going to call them naked ladies and gentlemen. They also go by surprise lilies and resurrection lilies. A lot of people are familiar with this plant. A lot of people don't know what it is, though. The foliage is going to come up about the time your daffodil foliage comes up in February, March, but then it doesn't flower. It's going to have the foliage die back at the same time the daffodils do. And then around July, you're going to see these stalks start popping up in your yard or garden, and then they explode in these bright pink flowers. Um, and in July, we always get questions, hey, what are these flowers popping up? It's a great plant to incorporate into your shade garden or your sun garden. Um, the foliage comes up, it dies back, like I said. Then your other spring and summer perennials cover that up. And then at our house in Shelbyville, we have these planted in amongst some hostas. So in July, you get these big pink flowers that look like they're coming out of a hosta, but it's really not. So it's just a really fun plant to incorporate. And um, with the common names they go by, this is another one that's really fun to get kids excited about gardening. This was the first plant that my four-year-old son learned both the botanical and the common name of. So, so if you're looking to get kids involved in gardening, this is one of the great ones to do it with. And we'll go on to Paul. All right, uh, Jacob, thanks. Um, in the perennial world, we'll move on to uh, things other than bulbs. Um, this is one that's a relatively new one that uh, we all have agreed is hands down one of the better performers, especially for late bloom. And how many perennials do you know that will grow in shade and flower with nice bright blooms, but also do it in September and October? Uh, this uh, Chelone or turtle head uh, is uh, from a Dutch breeding program. Uh, there's a form out there called Hot Lips that's been on the market for years that gets about three, three and a half feet tall and gets is topped with these bright pink flowers. But tiny tortuga, the little turtle head and tortuga, for anybody who speaks Spanish, is turtle or tortoise. Um, this, is, this one pops out at about 12 to maybe 18 inches tall at the, at the most. It's a great perennial for either um, mostly sun, probably not hot afternoon sun, but it can take most of the day of sun. It can take some light shade. It likes a moist soil, um, but it gives you this great blast of bright fuchsia pinkish blooms, uh, September and October. As far as I know, nothing out there eats it. It's a really good, durable, long-lived plant. And actually, even though it makes a great perennial and a mixed border, Sadie has had a couple of uh, these chelonies in a container um, in uh, the walled garden at Udell for a couple of years. And it's done incredibly well just sitting in a container all summer, all year long. Uh, so tiny tortuga, it's a smaller version than what you'll typically see on the market. It's uh, about half the size of the hot lips cultivar that's commonly found. Um, and I, actually for, for a, a mid-fall blast of color, one of my very favorite plants for the shade garden. So top that, Sadie. Okay. Hang um, on one second, Sadie. Before Sadie, can you, Sadie can you hold on one second? We just, before we get too far, we have a question about the naked ladies. Are they good for shade? We have a wooded property, so that would be for Jacob. Uh, they do perfectly fine in shade. Um, we've got some planted at our house uh, underneath walnut trees, so that's also going to be one that does well with the walnut toxicity. Uh, we have them here at Udell underneath the beech trees um, adjacent to the pavilion restrooms. So anywhere from the full sun in the middle of your yard to uh, the deep dark shade underneath trees are going to do great. Because when the foliage is up and they're starting to uh, store all their carbohydrates with their leaves, most of your trees are still going to be um, bare of leaves. So, so most of your spring bulbs um, will do fine in shade or sun. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Sadie, it's back to you. Perfect. But what I was saying is, I, Paul, I definitely agree with you for that turtle head. It's an absolutely phenomenal plant in the garden. Um, but this next one is another phenomenal shade plant. And being a relatively new gardener, um, I really, really love all shade perennials of all sorts. So in my own home garden that I started in March, 
This Dysperopsis pernii is one of the plants that I planted. Um, and actually, I bought all of my plants from New Dell, and this one is particularly piqued my interest. So it's a semi-evergreen plant in the shade. So this is kind of treated like your hellebores and things like that. You'll cut them back super, super early spring, right before they shoot up their new foliage. And it's just a fantastic plant to have in the garden for year round color. And what I really like about this plant is you really have to get up close to see it, but the stems almost have a blackish purple tinge to them, which I think is really cool in the shade garden. It really pops when everything else is gone. Um, and I just think this is a really cool plant. And the common name is Evergreen Solomon Seal. Um, so it looks a lot like some of your polygonatums, but like I said, this one is semi evergreen. And it also tolerates a variety of conditions. So at my home garden, it is an extremely dry, unwatered area right underneath the tree. And it just thrives and spreads really, really well. So I highly recommend this Dysprosis perinii. So the next one will go to Jacob again. All right. Um, if you get to know me and know my gardening style, the bigger the plant, the better. Uh, I don't like to mess around with those little two, three, four inch tall plants. And this one fits right into my category of favorites. It's the Aurelia cordata or Sun King spikenard. We've got several of these planted around Udell. It's going to easily get up to four or five foot tall and mature after two or three years in the garden. Um, we've got one right on the corner of the secret garden as you're starting to go down the hill towards the greenhouses and the pavilion. Um, but, but just a phenomenal plant. Uh, the picture you see here is actually the one in the garden I just talked about the location of. It gets morning sun, uh, but after that, it's deep dark shade with the beech trees and hollies uh, that are over top of it. So it doesn't take too much sun to keep this bright chartreuse color. And it does die back to the ground each year. So you actually get five foot of new growth each year. Um, it's planted right next to an Empress Wu Hosta which is the largest hosta on the market, and it dwarfs that plant. It started blooming about a month ago, and it gets these little white flowers on there that the, the pollinators, uh, flies and bees and wasps and everything really come to it and are attracted. And right now, if you look at it in the garden, it's, um, it's that it's fruit, which are dark purple berries that contrast really well with the um, foliage. But this is, a, it's a foliage plant uh, you wouldn't plant it for the flowers. That's just a little bit of an added bonus, but a really great plant. And I think this was the Perennial Plant Association of the Year's plant of the year last year or the year before. So it's a, it's a great plant and popular across the market. And we'll go on to, I think Paul's got another big perennial here coming up. Okay. All right. Uh, since Jacob uh, is keeping us moving in the, in the realm of larger plants, our favorite large fern. Uh, fern ferns are so underutilized. Uh, everybody has shade somewhere, and people always call us and ask us, what's the best one, maybe two ferns for this area? And the Dixie wood fern, Dryopteris australis, to me is about as foolproof a fern as you can get for a Kentucky garden. Uh, it's a clumping fern that will get to three to four feet tall, stands nice and upright, um, and holds that shape through the whole growing season and then well well into the fall, even after they get, they get frosted a bit. Great texture plant. The deer don't eat it. About the only thing the deer will do will damage is if you get a really nice lush mass growing, they might decide to just lay down in it. Uh, but they don't, they don't chew on the Dixie wood fern. Um, it, can take a little bit of dry once it's established, but like most ferns, not really great for a super dry site. But as long as you give it a little bit of moisture and a little bit of shade from the afternoon sun, it can actually take some mo morning sun, but afternoon uh, shade is really important. This thing just grows and grows and the clumps get a little bit bigger. You can dig them up, divide them like daylilies. They divide very easily, um, but they make a super mass in the garden. And like I said, if if you were going to grow just one fern and only had one room, only had room for one, and you were going to invite Jacob to see your garden and you didn't want to hear him complain about little itsy bitsy ferns, this would be the one. So great, great one for texture in the garden. So you're up next, Sadie. 
Alrighty, so now that they've talked about all the big stuff, we're going to get really tiny again. So we have Euchra Red Lightning, also known by the common name of Coral Bells. Um, these are really cool, very appealing plants, especially when you see them on the tables here at Udell and also on the website. The coloring and the striking foliage of these plants is just absolutely breathtaking. But what I realized as garden manager here at Udell, we've planted a lot of these in the garden displays, in the ground, and they just don't perform as well um, as what we would like. So actually this plant I highly recommend for any containers. This is an extremely tough plant. It will survive the entire winter in a really nice garden container. Um, so with this one, what I'm planning to do when I purchase this at a plant sale is to actually put this in large containers and stick it in random places in my shade garden. Um, so adding some much needed pops of color throughout the shade garden and giving my garden different dimensions and different heights that you can look at. So that's what I recommend for the Hugo Red Lightning. We also have a couple of other cultivars that are chartreuse in color, which are also really cool. Um, but this is a definitely one that I would keep in a container. It doesn't seem to like the wet clayey soils that most gardens have. Um, and it just does extremely well, very low maintenance. You don't have to water it very often either because we have one sitting, I think it's the caramel cultivar in, um, outside our kitchen of the administrative building and we water it occasionally but it's been in that container for about three or four years and it's still going strong so very cool plant and definitely something to add to any shade garden and then we'll go on to Jacob okay fair enough I won't talk about a four to five foot shade perennial this time we're going to go six to seven feet tall and we're going to be in the sun garden this time Veronicastrum virginicum, or Culver's root. Uh, this is a native plant to this area. Uh, we've got a mature specimen in our home garden in Shelbyville that we just loved to watch this summer. And about June or July, it was in full flower, um, upright, and the pollinators, if you're into a pollinator garden, um, this one was in our top three plants that the pollinators came to. Uh, it just swarmed with all kinds of stuff and we were able to get out there and watch it and why it our sun came out and was able to see all the insects in the garden. And even before it flowers, uh, the plant has world leaves. So the leaves are in a circular motion or formation around the stem. So it gives you a little bit different interesting texture uh, before it flowers. And then honestly, after it flowered, it stayed nice and green. It just kind of flops over and blends in with the rest of your perennials in your uh, perennial border. So this is, it's been a standout plant at our home garden um, all year. And I'm hoping it's big enough this year that we can get in there and chop it up and divide it a little bit and have more. All right, Paul, what do you got next? Oops. Hang on, Paul. To to there you go. It's time to move to woodies now. Uh, we have enough of those herbaceous things. Uh, sometimes plants are the victim of their own success. Uh, Calicarpa, the beauty bushes, there's a number of different species out there that do well here. The biggest problem is that they don't do what you see in the photo here in the spring when most people are in garden centers buying plants. If a plant looked like this in the spring, we could sell a million of them a week but they don't do this until September. Uh, the uh, Calicarpa dicotoma, the Japanese beautyberry, uh, the acai cultivar, uh, this one's gonna mature between about two and a half, maybe three and a half, four feet tall at the, at the most, kind of a broad spreading, fine textured shrub. And you don't really grow this thing for the flowers. Um, it'll flower with small, uh, little whitish pink blooms at the ends of the branches in midsummer. Uh, but they're really not all that showy. The nice thing is those flowers do form on new wood. So even if you cut this thing way back to the ground in the winter, it'll come up and, and grow, it'll flower. And then this time of the year, it'll just be a, a small fountain mass of these brilliant amethyst fruits. You get about two months worth of color out of them. They don't make it through, once we get a good freeze, that's about the end of the display on these things. But for a good couple of months through the fall, you get this great display of this color. It's pretty unique uh, in terms of uh, fruit color in the garden, in the landscape. And the fact that you can cut it back and still get flowers and fruit 
make it a great plant for combining with other perennials or as in masses. Actually, the, um, the Walmart in Crestwood, in the parking lot medians, they actually have this plant planted. And some years it gets cut back to the ground by the grounds crew. Some years it gets run over by snow plows and it just keeps coming back and flowering and fruiting. Uh, the cultivar is Sai, that actually refers to a selection that fruits heavily as a young plant. And so this one, even as a small plant, when you put it in the ground, you get good fruit display out of it. So there's a whole bunch of other species of beautyberry out there, but, but uh, this one fits in just about any garden because of its smaller size. Great fall fruit and uh, always been one of my favorites. So go to town, Jacob. Hey, Sadie. Yes. I have a question for you about the red lightning. Is it a slow grower? And how many would you recommend to a large ceramic pot? I don't think it's a relatively slow grower. It's pretty quick. Jacob can correct me on this from the nursery standpoint. Um, but I think they're definitely relatively quick to grow. And depending on the container size, um, let me try to think. <laughs> um, I like to shove a lot of things into one container. Um, so I would definitely go heavier than fewer. Um, but if it was... I'm really bad at um, determining a size too. So if it was like a 20 inch container, I would put like six in it. <laughs> so I like to jam them full um, and then they would create a really nice display. It's a good question though. Um, yeah, and then actually Paul, I'm next. Um, so oh, sorry. I have an, yeah. oh, you're fine. <laughs> I have another Woody. Um, usually I'm an herbaceous perennial kind of girl, um, but since having my own garden and actually starting gardening in general three or four years ago professionally, this Cephalanthus occidentalis magical moonlight is the cultivar or button bush has been one of my very, very favorites since the very beginning of my career. So with this plant, we have a couple of them planted in our Ronceville Pavilion garden. Um, and it's an absolutely phenomenal plant. This one maxes out about five to six feet wide and tall. Um, and it's a very dense grower. And my favorite part, you can probably tell in this photo, is definitely the blooms. These start midsummer and continue on throughout July, August, and a little bit of September. And then they lose all of those little flower parts and you're just left with a little globe um, or the button button bush is its name and they're just really cool these are also really great for pollinators so you'll see all kinds of different insects on these from bees wasps moths all kinds of really cool things and it's just a really phenomenal plant and i know in my garden as of now i have the cultivar sugar shack which is a smaller dwarf variety and the little buttons stay like a maroony red once they're finished but this one i'll definitely be adding to my garden because Based out of the experience I've had at Udell, this is a phenomenal grower. And being it's planted in the Ronceville Pavilion Garden here at Udell, probably one of the worst sites you could possibly have it. It's super clay, super heavy soil. Um, and the soil prep was not very well when this was planted. So it's extremely tough and will tolerate the worst of Kentucky soil conditions. So I highly recommend it for that. And it's also another really good plant if you have a little bit of a wet spot in your garden this plant will also thrive in that location as well. So highly recommend the Cephalanthus. It's definitely out of the five I've picked for today, my top favorite. And then on to Jacob now. Sadie, I think uh, out of all the flowers in the garden, that could be voted the coolest actual flower itself with its, it's shape. It's fantastic, <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> And I will uh, make a little note, uh, if you're following along on our plant sale list that we published, I have that plant listed as Moonlight Fantasy Button Bush. And we just corrected ourselves. And it's actually in the Magical Series and the cultivar is Moonlight, but that is the same plant that you are seeing uh, in the photo and on the plant sale list that's listed as Moonlight Fantasy instead of Magical Moonlight. But, but fabulous plant all around. And I'm going to stay out in the sun garden uh, with the sun perennial, the Aster tetericus, Tegendi. This is the variety, Tetarian Aster. I snapped this picture when we were at the Chicago Botanic Garden last October. And I believe it was 
a year ago next week. So this was a very late season picture. We we're right in the middle of aster season in the garden. And if you're familiar with the New England aster, it's going to have the bluish purple flowers and some will have pink flowers. But if you're familiar with the plant, uh, every time it grows three new leaves and gets taller, the three leaves below that turn brown. And it just works its way up to where eventually when it flowers this time of year, it's just flowers, three green leaves, and brown leaves. The great thing about this plant, it's got bigger, more bold leaves, so it adds a bigger texture throughout the summer. And it stays green from the ground all the way up to the flowers. Um, but bright yellow centers, uh, and you can see it in the picture with the lavender petals. It's just a really great plant, and this in the, in the mass planting is, is really nice this time of year. Uh, the ones that we have in the sale are not in flower, uh, just the rosetta leaves, but they're in a nice big trade two gallon, uh, close to a true two gallons. Um, really nice plants to get in the ground this fall and, uh, and get a display like this next year. Paul, where are you going next? Oh, hang on, Paul. Here we go. Here we are. Um, Got to have equal time for woodies, and so I'm going to do my last one as a Wygela. Now, that may not seem like the obvious choice. Uh, there's loads of Wygelas out there on the market, especially that have come out over the last 10 years, a lot with burgundy foliage and kind of pinkish, uh, rosy blooms. But honestly, we've trialed a whole bunch of them, and they just are not fabulous. Uh, however, this one, this is this is a one that you almost never see available for sale in the country. Uh, Wygela praecox, it's a completely different species than what you typically see. Uh, the Wygela florida, which is the more common Wygela. This one blooms uh, in the in the mid-spring before most of the other Wygelas do. Uh, pure white blooms with yellow stamens in the center. And while I will admit this is definitely a one-hit wonder, I mean, this blooms once in the spring, the blooms will last about 10 to 12 days, and then it's just a big green bush that will get to be maybe five, six feet tall and wide. But when it's in bloom, it is just the pure white, the bright, uh, bright, bright green foliage. It's just such a fresh, great plant for that time of the year. Uh, and the white is a really good one to serve as a foil for other uh, bright colored flowers. So it mixes in really well with perennial borders, with mixed shrub borders. Um, and it's a really dependable plant. A lot of these newer Wajillas with the purple foliage, it, as long as you stand over them with an eyedropper and give them a drop of water every 12 seconds, they seem okay. But any stress at all, and they just kind of go backwards. This thing just kind of keeps growing and growing and growing once it's established light shade, full sun, any reasonable soil, uh, and, a, and a, just a good addition for the, the spring mixed border. So it's kind of a throwback, kind of an old fashioned garden plant, but you see it so seldom and it performs so reliably. I had to include it here to get one more woody on the list. So that's my last one. Go ahead, Sadie. Alrighty, so for my last one, uh, the picture we have doesn't quite do this plant justice, um, but over the past year, I've really fallen in love with grasses, sedges, carexes, all of the grassy things, and this Budalua gracilis, blonde ambition, or blue grandma grass is really fantastic for gardens. So you can see in this photo, it's planted in a really tough area. So it's kind of in our raised bed situation because we have the lower greenhouses to the left of this photo. It's right next to our rock house, a paved landing area where the picnic tables are. And then to the front side of it, there's also a little driveway or a path for people to walk down. So it is in a very dry, ignored, harsh little island at Udell. And it just does its thing and it's happy and it spreads and it does not care at all that we do not water it. <laughs> so I think in the time I've been here at Udell going on three and a half years, I've watered this supplementally once and it is just tough. It continues to grow. And the really cool thing about this plant, which you can't really tell in this photo, is the little tiny seed heads and flowers on this thing. So if you get really close, sometimes it's called the eyebrow grass. 
Um, for some reason, I like to call it the grasshopper grass, but the little um, seed heads stick out horizontally and they just look like little eyebrows all over this plant. And they're really, really cool. And grasses in general are really great for all season interest. So we usually leave these all throughout the winter season and it just provides a really nice um, breakup of the pavement and everything else being dormant so the bare mulch. Um, grasses are really great for adding that interest to a space where it is mistreated um, and very, very dry. So highly recommend this grass. And Udell has a really, really nice um, display of this here next to the rock house. So on to Jacob. All right, thanks, Sadie. And I know what you all are thinking. Surely he wouldn't pick a plant that's taller than the Verona castrum at six to seven foot, but I did. So the Eutrochium fistulosum, uh, this used to be a Eupatorium, but they changed the genus over to Eutrochium. Uh, it's one of those unfortunate plants that has the name weed in the common name. So a hollow gel pie weed. Uh, there's a lot of great plants for the garden with that ugly word in there, ironweed, milkweed. Um, but this doesn't mean that it's a bad plant by any means. The definition of a weed is a plant that is somewhere where you don't want it. But this is a plant that you definitely want in your garden. If you've got room for a big plant, uh, if you put this in a good site and take good care of it, it can get eight, nine, ten foot tall. Uh, so it's going to make a really bold statement. This is actually a picture of it in flower that I took uh, last week here at the garden. So these are the actual plants for sale. Um, another great pollinator plant Another great one for kids, just because it's, like I said, it's so tall. Uh, so if you take a, a three-foot kid and put it next to a nine-foot Joe Pye weed, they're going to have a lot of fun looking up at that one. Um, but great for your sunny meadows, your pollinated meadows, um, or even really a, a corner piece on your house. Um, it's going to die back each year uh, in the winter, but, you know, you can get that kind of high. It's going to get up to your gutter line. So have fun with this plant. Uh, try it out. And I think you'll uh, think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, and like Paul said, um, everybody got to choose five plants. I chose five, but since I made the PowerPoint, I really wanted to talk about this plant. And if you look at that cute little kid there, he kind of looks like me. Uh, but that's my son Wyatt, and we snapped this picture over at Whitehall this spring. This is a hybrid dogwood, so it's a cross between three different types of dogwood, including our native Cornus, Florida. Uh, but this is the Venus dogwood. And I know he's only four years old and he's smaller, uh, but the flowers on this really and truly do get five to six inches across. Uh, six might be an exaggeration, but five inches you can pull off. Um, the nice thing about this one is it blooms after the foliage comes out, unlike our flowering dogwood that is native to this area. So it's, it's really a great plant. We've got a nice specimen of this um, near our rock house. Um, behind our glass greenhouse. Um, and, and just the show that it puts on in flower is, is well worth it. And like our native dogwoods that are starting to flower up with that deep maroon color, this is also starting to show its fall color in the garden today. I took a look at, yeah, I took a look at it before I came over to do this video. And unlike the deep maroon of the corn of Florida, uh, this one red to that additional great fall color uh, fantastic display in the spring with these huge white flowers and I think you've got 10 of these nine or ten of these in the sale coming up tomorrow morning but that's going to take care of our last plant that we were going to talk about today um, so if anybody out there has any questions uh, feel free to shout them out and we'll get them answered for you and I'm really glad you could take time out of your day to join us and hope to see you tomorrow online See you tomorrow online. If anybody has any questions, type them in the chat box and we'll get them answered for you. And we have a question about shipping on plants. No, they're pickup um, and you schedule the pickup when you order your plants. Um, I have a question about when will the email with the passcode for members go out? 
I, I think that's going out later this afternoon or early this evening, one or the other, but should should be going out fairly soon. Excellent. Any other questions? Can, does everyone want to vote for their favorite while we're just sort of wrapping up here of those 15 plans, 16 plans? Well, I vote for the five that I presented. <laughs> Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, we will make this recording available. Uh, um, and I'm not going to pronounce these correctly, so I apologize. The Hushera, I think that was yours, Sadie, and the Tiny Tortuga, we got to vote for that. But we'll make this recording available on the plan cell page. So if you want to go back and take another look, or if you um, had to, um, if you came in early or, came, or had to leave early or came in late, all the information will be there. And we'll look forward to the plan sale launching nine o'clock in the morning. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.